Good morning, all. Welcome, 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 welcome. If you didn't get handouts, there are several of them. Some are uh, things you've already, I've already pushed at you before, like a calendar for next year and, a, and the application for next year. Um, it, uh, if um, I, I especially am eager to find out about next year because I need to order books. Uh, it, and again, if you've got your own source of books, that's totally okay. I don't need to order them for you, but if I'd like to have the books you need for the fall by May class, and, and to do that, I, I kind of need to know like soon, so if you could do that much at least. I don't need money, but I need to know if you need books, put it that way. Good morning, all. Um, welcome. We have a few folks with us we've not had for a while. And other folks who've been with us who aren't here today, there is a uh, Diocesan Council of Catholic Women meeting, big wig meeting, and a couple of our members are, are there. Uh, we have somebody in COVID jail because they uh, were exposed to somebody. We have, a, we, have a, we have a member of our class who actually has COVID. He got it from somebody at work. So um, uh, they'll be viewing later uh, with this. Um, again, we have an exam today. Well, one of the handouts is I, I looked, I, there's a few of you I haven't, before the day ends, a couple of you I don't think I have an exam from, believe it or not. And um, I need to, I'd like to see that. So, um, but the answers I put out, the, my suggested answers, uh, I did review your work. I looked at a couple questions in particular, I looked at the map especially. So you'll see some marks or some words from me. Uh, but uh, as for the, the kind of the, um, we were kids, we had fill in the blank questions and then we had, th we call, they didn't call them thought questions. The thought question ones, I, I, put, I put my answers on a sheet of paper and you can kind of compare and contrast. Here's what I think a good answer would, would look like, okay? We're going to have the quiz on unit two, but it's going to be again like the end of the day because C. Cecilia B. DeMills, who does the recording, has to be in the cross by five. So I have to readjust the day. So I'm sorry um, if, if it's going to make you vomit your lunch. Um, I don't know what to tell you, but uh, you did it last time. We'll do it again. So we're going to be heavy on lecture in this morning so that the day, the, the close of the day, you know, we can do the small group. We can do the, the, um, uh, the quiz a -rui thing. Okay? All right? A word of prayer. And then we'll start. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. good and gracious God, we give you thanks in this season of Easter for your Son's victory over death. We need that victory and, and, and over death and over its surrogates, uh, evil and sin and, uh, and twistedness of heart. So, in, as we celebrate your victory, uh, may, we, may our hearts be open to share it with you. Bless this group who's here this morning. Bless those who are uh, at home today for, or at other, other meetings uh, who will view this later and, and study later. Help us keep focus on what, this, what we're about here today, which is to get to know your word. Not to get a grade, not to have a perfect exam, uh, but help <laughs> us put first that knowledge to know you better. We ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, John's passion. Um, again, not families have different habits and customs about church. My family was a, was a family that we always went to Good Friday service. And so I remember uh, you know, hearing John's gospel because every Good Friday, it is the passion from the Gospel of John is what we hear. But it, it was only when I was in seminary and studied this stuff that it really, it suddenly, my eyes were opened to the very different approach that John takes and what John is trying to say. I think it's a, it's a happy circumstance that we meet just a couple weeks after Good Friday if you did attend Good Friday service, if you, or just read the gospel on your own because it's part of your devotional life for Good Friday, I hope you brought a new set of eyes to it. In one sense, 
John's account of Jesus' passion and death feels like solid ground. That is, for those who know the synoptic stories, you know, the similar sequence, similar acts, uh, similar characters, um, similar s substance. But a closer look that maybe you made this time will reveal again the Johannine difference. In short, if I was going to summarize the Johannine difference in the passion story, it is that Jesus is always in charge. That Jesus takes the initiative. It's not the actions of others in the end that lead to his death, though of course Pilate and the chief priests all have a role in it, but it is in John's view, this is what Jesus came for. Look at John chapter 10, verse 11. I think I probably look, had you look at this last month. Verse 10, I'm sorry, chapter 10, verse 11. Jesus says, this is the good shepherd section. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd, active verb, lays down his life for the sheep. Look at verses 17 and 18 of the same chapter. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. So that boldness on Jesus' part is the distinctive difference in the passion that we're going to... Now, again, if I asked you... If I, it, I should have done it maybe last time before you read, John. If I'd say, let's put together the story of the passion. I could have said, you know, uh, Holy Week is coming two, two weeks away. What's the, what happens at Jesus' death? How does it happen? You, I'm betting, you would have given me all the details that come from the synoptics. The garden. Jesus prays. Disciples go to sleep. Three times he has to rouse them. The, 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 the temple people come. Judas smacks Jesus on the cheek and they arrest him. That's the story you have in your mind of that scene. None of that is in John's gospel. None of it. He has a very different presentation. So, and, 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 and you, if you say, well, well, I'm confused. Uh, how, how, if, if, if that didn't happen, or, or I guess the question lies behind it, which, which of the passages is the more true to history. I'll, again, I'll lay my cards on the table. Um, the author, the gospel evangelist here, knows what happened. But I, it's my perception that he presents not always what happened, but what it meant, or what should have happened. Um, I shared a room with my older brother for six years when we were kids, and he was a Boy Scout. He got Boy's Life magazine. And I, you know, I just read anything, and I, so I would go through his boys' lives. In the back part, there were these weird kind of advertisements for kids. And one thing they were selling, it wasn't, it wasn't Boy Scouts, it was somebody bought an ad, was glasses, x-ray uh, X glasses, okay, that would allow you to look through walls. And I remember that, I remember that little picture of that, this kid with like, with like, like, like lightning, lightning bolts coming out of his eyes. In a sense, John's gospel is the gospel of the passion, is the passion with those glasses that, that reveal what it meant. Uh, the synoptics generally, I think, likely give the more historical presentation. Had you been there with a camera, what you would have seen. But John wants to tell us what it means, what it means. And, we'll, and again, I'm not saying that there aren't incidents in John that really did happen. I'm not saying that. But with, where John varies from the synoptics, I tend, to, I tend to stand with the synoptics as being the historical storyline. But John is the one who pulls back the curtain to explain what it means. And you know, I think that in, in some sense, that's the more important thing. You know, to know the facts, okay, but to know what it means, ah, that's huge.
So let's look at chapter 18 with the arrest. Jesus has an agony, you know, like, like the agony in the garden, but it happened earlier. Keep your finger on chapter 18, but I'm going to page back to chapter 12, uh, beginning with verse 27. This is just after Jesus talked about the, the grain of wheat must die. Um, Jesus says in verse 27 of chapter 12, Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. See, isn't that exactly what Jesus did say in the synoptics? Father, take this cup away from me. But in John, it's Jesus asking a rhetorical question. Should I have, should I say, have said, Father, save me from this hour? And immediately he responds, no. For this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. So the whole scene that the synoptics have taking place at the garden with Jesus' prayer, take this cup, John smashes into two verses where Jesus has a moment of, do I, I don't really want to do this, but I must do this. You know, just that immediately. So again, elements that are familiar to us from the synoptic story are found, but handled very differently. So, when the Roman temple police appear in the garden, Jesus is totally composed. Look, let's, um, look at chapter 18, verse 4. Jesus, knowing all that was to befall him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? See, Jesus takes the initiative. Whom are you looking for? That doesn't, that's not how it appears in the synoptics. Okay. They answer, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he, is how my translation reads. But literally, it's ego, me. I am, period. Now, the translators, that makes no sense, I am. So, so they helpfully added me. But in doing that, what did they lose? They lost the voice of God in the, in the, in the uh, bush speaking to Moses. Who should I say sent me? What's your name? And from the, from the bush, God says, I am who am. Okay. So your translations are written for English speakers to grasp. But if you read it in Greek, it'd be really clear. It's ego emi. I am. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. But notice, Judas, Judas does not point Jesus out. See, that's the, that's the importance of the kiss of Judas in the synoptics. It's dark. They all have beards. They're not wearing name tags. Who's Judas? I mean, who's Jesus? So Judas embraces Jesus. So the police know who to grab, and the others run away. But in John's gospel, Jesus says, yo. So Judas is there, but he doesn't have a job. <laughs> or his most important, significant job has been taken away from him. Jesus, when, Je okay. when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. I think I mentioned this last time. Did that really happen? 220 soldiers, a cohort, collapsed to the ground? I don't think you would have seen that. But what John is saying is that's what you should have done because they were trying to arrest God. And remember, throughout the, throughout the Gospels, throughout the Bible, when a divine messenger appears, the appropriate stance is to collapse on the ground. Okay? So they are acting out against their own will the knowledge who Jesus is. So they, get all, they all get up. And Jesus asks the question again, who are you looking for? Again, they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I told you, I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word which he had spoken, quote, of those whom you have given me, I did not lose one. Now that, so what has Jesus done there? He's exchanged, he's made an exchange. Let my disciples go, and I will go with you. So in a sense, that is the gospel story right there and there. Jesus 
exchanges himself for the, the, the lives of his own. Huh? Simon Peter pulls out his sword and takes a slash. Um, Jesus heals the man, and then they take, they take Jesus off. See, though, so there's no emphasis on the disciples of Jesus running away because they didn't run away. Does it say he healed them? I don't see that. They said it again? It doesn't say he healed them. Maybe you're right. It's in Luke he heals him. Good point. Points. He just lets him bleed, I guess. Okay? Um, <laughs> In Luke's gospel, see, this is the danger. We all drag bits of the other gospels into, into the other readings. So no reference here to that at all. Um, but the disciples don't run away because they don't have to. They're just allowed to go. Okay? Verse 15. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple, as this disciple was known to the high priest. Now, in John chapter 20, we will be told that this disciple who gives Peter access to the chief priest's courtyard was the same beloved disciple who was at the Last Supper table. Remember? Who, who, is, who lays his head on Jesus' chest, who, when Jesus talks about somebody betraying him, Simon gestures to the beloved disciple, and the beloved disciple gets the information. Okay? So you're going to see Love Disciple resurface several times here. Okay? So there's no haphazard flight that of the disciples because Jesus has made a deal with the authorities. He's laid, he's, he lets them take him while they go. The next scene is in the courtyard. Look at verse 18. Now the servants and officers have made a charcoal fire. Now that's important. Not because spring is here and you're thinking about charcoal firing, but because charcoal will appear again in the gospel in the last chapter. Okay? Um, so Peter denies knowing Jesus. Meanwhile, the high priest and Jesus have the same kind of back and forth that you are familiar with the synoptics. Look at verse 20. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing secretly. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them, and they know what I said. When he had said this, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand. Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, bear witness to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Do you see how little there is of the trial? There really is very, because in John's gospel, the emphasis is not on Jesus on trial before the priests. It's Jesus on trial before Pilate. Uh, meanwhile, back outside, Simon Peter once again denies knowing who Jesus is, and the cock crows in verse 27. 28. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was early. So notice there is no actual scene of Jesus being arraigned before Caiaphas in John. Okay? Because again, John wants to get to Jesus v. Pilate. That's the key passage for him. Now, how you need to see this. Um, first, pay attention to where Pilate is. Because Jesus is generally inside, and the crowds are outside. So Pilate goes out, and the crowds lay their charge against Jesus, and then Pilate will go in. And Jesus will, will you know, repartee with Pilate. And back, Pilate goes, and back he goes, and back. Now, this is the governor. He's the man in charge. But in John's gospel, he's not the man in charge. In fact, he is showing up his lack of chargeness in this. He, he will not command to the crowd what should be done, though he finds Jesus innocent. And he finds he's got no authority in front of Jesus. There is a, a, 
a way of, 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 re, of presenting this passion story that I saw once at a shrine in Belleville, Illinois. And they, 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 the, it, was, uh, it wasn't acted out completely, it was more like an oratorio where they stood and read. And the pilot, everybody else was wearing black, black pants and a white shirt. Uh, the, the, but Pilate's wearing gray because he can't decide. Not deciding is a problem in this gospel. Remember Nicodemus who came at night, chapter 3? That was a problem. Now Nicodemus, you could argue, develops through the, the passing of the gospel. But Pilate's inability, we're going to, let's focus on this scene here, okay? Verse 33. Actually, no. Verse 28. Uh, they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was early. They themselves did not enter the praetorium so that they might not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. So, what day is it? It's the day before the Passover. Now, that is different than in the synoptics, because the Last Supper in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is a Passover meal. The disciples of Jesus ask him before the arrest, where should we go to prepare the Passover supper? So we have two different calendars going on here. Now, it could be because, you know, we, we Catholics, we celebrate Easter when we did. The Orthodox have a different calendar. Their Easter isn't for another week yet, I think. Maybe it's this weekend. I don't even know. But So it could be that there were two communities that had, you know, John had one calendar and the, and the Jewish community had another I, it could be. Scholars have spilled a lot of ink trying to explain this difference. For me, it's, this is where I kind of get a sense of what I think John is doing. John is telling you what it should have been, what, what, it, what its significance was. Remember in the beginning of the gospel, John the Baptist, the first time he sees Jesus, he points to Jesus and he says what? Behold, the Lamb of God. And the Lamb of God is about to be sacrificed with the other lambs that will be eaten that night at Passover. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke have a different calendar. Jesus dies on Passover day. Now, again, you could argue, well, would the Jewish leaders really have, or would even Pilate really have chosen a holiday to do executions? I mean, even, you know, in our country, we do executions, but I don't know too many governors who choose Christmas Day for executions. So you could argue that maybe John has got the memory correct, huh? But in any case, we're, I'm going to point out to you how important the calendar is for John in his laying out his story. So they, they tell Pilate that, um, verse 29, Pilate went out to them. So he went out to them. What accusations do you bring against this man? And they answered, if this man were not an evildoer, we would not have handed him over. Pilate says, take him yourself and judge him. The Jews say, it's not lawful for us to put any man to death. This was to fulfill the word which Jesus had spoken to show by what death he was to die. Remember, three times he said, the Son of Man must be lifted up on the cross. If the Jewish people wanted to execute you, they didn't use the cross. That was a Roman punishment. They would stone you. Stone you. That was, again, it was, a, it was a mob action in Jesus' day. Stephen is, is murdered in the Acts of the Apostles by stoning. By the way, do you know why I'm, I'm happy that Jesus died on the cross and not by stoning? Because if he had my stoning, then every time he started prayer, he'd be this way. <laughs> I know, that's low. I know it's very low. It's very low. <laughs> okay, so back to the text. Okay, so Pilate goes inside and asks in verse 33, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus responds, Do you say this on your own, or do others say so? Pilate, am I not a Jew? It's your own nation that, ha that hands you over. Jesus answered, My kingship is not of this world. If my kingship were of this world, my servants would fight that I might not be handed over to the Jews. My kingship is not from this world. Kingship, authority. You know, Jesus is not just a king. Huh? He's God. He's the divine one. His authority is over the whole universe and beyond. But, so Pilate says, so you are a king. Jesus said, you choose the word king. 
the reason I was born, the reason I came into the world is to give testimony to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate says, what is truth? Now, I have heard preachers say, well, Pilate's, you know, he's trying to understand. Or remember um, uh, the Passion of the Christ. Do you I don't know if you remember that, if you, you saw it. Do you remember it? Um, um, uh, what's his name? Um, Mel. Mel, thank you, first name basis. Mel, <laughs> Mel leans his characterization as that Pilate is kind of a philosopher. You know, he's trying, to, he's trying to understand the truth. Now, that may be, but that's not what John is trying to say. What is John trying to say? Back in chapter 14, at the Last Supper, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. So when Jesus talks about truth, he's like, ta-da! And Pilate goes, truth, what's truth? Pilate is showing a kind of cynicism, I, it, it, again, as John portrays him, a kind of cynicism. So you see, there's a variety of different takes on, on, on how this story is played out. But in John, there's no question about Jesus' authority. So Pilate goes back outside, verse 38. After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no crime in him. Then Pilate tries to deal with the crowd by making the deal like with Barabbas. Um, and uh, or at least mentions that at least. Then chapter 19, Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. Okay, verse 4. Pilate went out again and said, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no crime in him. That's the second time. Okay, He has uh, proclaimed Jesus' innocence. So Jesus comes out dressed with the robe and the crown of thorns, and the crowd shouts, Crucify him. Pilate says in verse 6, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no crime in him. It's the third time. Now in the synoptics in Luke's gospel, that's also the case. Three times, Pilate confronts the crowd with, this man is innocent. The Jews answered, we have a law, and by that law he ought to die, because he, was, he has made himself the son of God. When Pilate heard these words, he was the more afraid. He entered the praetorium. Now, in the last scene, Jesus had come out, but now Jesus is back inside, because Pilate goes back inside. Okay, again, it's part of the dynamics of the, of the characterization here that he has to be back inside. So Pilate goes back inside. Where are you from? Now, remember, through the gospel, what is the answer Jesus has given anytime people ask that kind of question? What's, what's, what's the Jonah answer? Well, that's good. At the beginning, but later what does he say? I am from and you are from below. So Pilate has got his finger on the right question. <laughs> Where are you from? But Jesus will not answer. Okay? He gave no answer. Pilate says, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you? And Jesus shoots right back and says, you have no authority if it had not been given to you from my Father, from the one who's above. Verse 12, upon this, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, so we, we're outside again, huh? If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king sets himself against Caesar. So Pilate is really concerned now, and he brings, this is the seventh scene, he brings Jesus. So the inside now comes to the outside, and Jesus is presented to the crowds. Now, verse 14, it was the day of preparation of the Passover. Notice, the day of preparation. John is very explicit about this. It was about the sixth hour. What time is that? Noon. Yeah, don't be shy. Noon. Okay, noon. And why is that important? That's when they sacrificed Well, we got to go a little, st you're right, but you got to stretch a little bit. Remember, what does back, think back last year, okay, when Moses after the, the plague, the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn is, is announced, Moses tells the people to select the lamb and, and to, to slaughter it and get ready to cook it and eat it that night and not let any of it hang over the next day. And when does Moses say to slaughter the animal? 
twilight, right, nightfall, because that's the next day. That's literally the day they're going to escape. That's, that's the day of in Jewish mind, remember? Night, the day begins at nightfall. So in Exodus 12 and 13, all the tribes, people, all the Hebrew slaves are slaughtering the, who do it, slaughter the animal at sunset. But Passover is one of these feast days, remember the three great feast days when Jews who could made the trip. So there were hundreds of thousands of visitors to Jerusalem. Uh, Josephus estimates half a million. He may be smoking something there. That's all I mean. But it's, it's, it's like the city population doubles or triples. And there was not enough room in the city, so they, 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 they allowed the suburbs, Bethany and Bethphage, to count. And the animals could be slaughtered as soon as the sun went past the meridian. Afternoon. So just as Pilate is handing Jesus over across town at the temple, the first little lamb meh, is getting its throat cut. Now, he doesn't say that in so many words, because he expects that all his readers have been brought into the know, like you are, have been brought into the know. And you can easily miss it. So what? It was, it was 12, the sixth hour. It's the day of preparation, the sixth hour. That's when the great slaughter begins that celebrates the escape from Egyptian slavery. Okay? Um, verse 15. Pilate says, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Now, again, students of the Old Testament, who, remember when, when uh, the people wanted a king, uh, Samuel, you know, and God says, you know, they want, they, they're going to make Samuel, I mean, sorry, it's, yeah, it is Samuel, and, and they're going to make Saul king, and, and Samuel's all upset about it, and God says, in choosing a king, they have chosen to reject me as king. So to say, we have no king but Caesar, is the absolute worst thing you could say in a Jew, by a Jew. And who says it? Not the crowds, the chief priests, the spokespeople for the tradition say, we have no king but Caesar. Okay, so like, ooh. So then they haul Jesus off, okay? And, and he, and this is where they had that scene where Pilate makes the sign, the title. Not that, not that Pilate, I can't imagine Pilate ever himself doing it. He'd say, chop, chop, get my sign guy in here, make a sign. But again, the significance is that it's Pilate who makes the sign that says, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And the chief priest, who are looking over his shoulder, say, don't say, don't write that. Say he, he pretended to be, he, he claimed to be. And Pilate answers, what I have written, I have written. Now, this is what gives Mel Gibson the hope that deep inside Pilate is coming to faith. But it could easily be seen as it's Pilate going at the Jewish high priests who have made this so difficult for him. Okay? Again, it's, I think it's dangerous to psychoanalyze any characters based on the Gospels because they just don't, they're not clued in to the kind of questions that we would love to know. What was Pilate thinking? Well, we don't really know. We have his actions. We have his actions. Um, notice the inscription was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek so that the whole, quote unquote, the whole world. Now, the whole world doesn't speak Latin, Hebrew, or Greek, but the whole empire, the whole Roman Empire speaks Latin, Hebrew, or Greek. So it's a universal proclamation that Christ is king, proclaimed by Pilate, the governor. Then, they, then they're suddenly, then they're at the Golgotha. No, what, what, don't, what don't you see here? Again, keep asking yourself, what does John not have that the other gospel writers have. Remember with Luke, Jesus had this conversation with the women of Jerusalem. Okay, there's none of that. And there's no Simon of Cyrene. Now I love the figure of Simon of Cyrene in the synoptics. But why would John maybe choose to over to overlook that? Because Jesus still needed help. Jesus is why do I not? Is he mocking? Because he's, 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 he's a 
How, how in charge is he, Peter? He is divine. <laughs> he is God. He's that in charge. So anything that would make Jesus seem dependent is just dropped. Okay? He's in charge. Very good. Then, verse 25. Um, they, divide the, they divide his garments. This is, and then there's a quotation from Psalm 22. Okay, that, that, that roots it. John, the evangelist, is very concerned with some key scripture passages. So Psalm 22 was quoted here. Jesus is not going to say, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? You can figure out why now, huh? Because he's God. Huh? <laughs> he is divine. He's not abandoned. He's in charge. He's in control. But there's still the allusion to Psalm 22. Standing by the cross of Jesus where his mother... His mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Notice, it's curious to me. John's gospel doesn't name Jesus' mother by her name. He says there are two women named Mary and a third woman, his mother. But in John's gospel, we're never, if all we had was John, we would not call her Mary because it's only, it's in Luke and Matthew and Mark that we get that tidbit. Is that a, just an accident? Again, I don't think so. Scholars don't think it's just an accident. Because, yes, of course, it is Mary, but John means it to mean more than Mary, as we're going to find out in the next episode here. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, not Peter, but the one he loved standing near, he said, Woman, behold your son. He said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Now, at, at one level, this is pointed out to a living. Jesus, from his, with his last breath, he's trying to take care of his mother, how much he loved his mother. Okay, I'll accept that. But there's something much bigger, much bigger going on there. This is the foundation of the church. Jesus' mother, who got him, remember at the beginning, the way to the, the Cana? I mean, she understood him, huh? And the beloved disciple who gets him, he leaves them as family. Family. And that makes the beloved disciple who to Jesus? Brother. Okay? And, and this is one thing that Mel Gibson got right. In a later episode, Jesus will be stabbed with a spear and blood and water will come out and in the, in the Mel Gibson film, it splatters on Mary. It should have splattered on the beloved disciple too. The church is established in the blood of Christ, in the water of baptism. Okay? So there, there is, this, this, this is Pentecost in a matter of speaking. I mean, the spirit's not mentioned, but it's the, it's the foundation of the church. Verse 29, no, Jesus, no, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that he all was now finished to fulfill the scripture, to fulfill the scripture. So Jesus is, he's doing these things because the, the scriptures call for it. He calls out, I thirst. A bowl of vinegar stood there, so they put a sponge full of vinegar on the hyssop and held it to his mouth. Sometime when you're home, look up online, look up hyssop. What it looks like, what you, know, what you imagine and what it looks like is very, it looks like a Boston fern. Boston fern, you know, leafy, low on the ground. It's a really poor thing to do to, to, to soak and to give it to somebody. You can't put a sponge on hyssop. It'll only be like this much higher than your hand. Not, it's not a spear. Hyssop. But you know what? It's a great plant if you're trying to take blood and daub it on the doorposts and lintels back in Exodus, the Passover scene, they, they take the, you, they're told to take the blood from the lamb and to use hyssop and daub it on the door to signal to the angel of death. So, again, John is making a direct connection to the Passover story. That Christ is the Passover victim. And Jesus' last words are, it is finished. 
Now what's finished? Well, I guess I would propose his task, the mission from the Father. He's accomplished what he came to do, and he bows his head and gave up his spirit. Notice again, active verbs. Remember, Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down. So as John presents it, Jesus is in charge even here. He lays down his life. Verse 38, um, after, uh, no, I, I skipped over the scene where, uh, to, to, to hurry along death, a, a person who is crucified, you know, they, they tend, you tend to die in the end from blood loss or, or from suffocation because you can't lift yourself up to breathe, you're all slunched down. And so to hurry that along, you break the bones so that you can't, I mean, you can't raise yourself up. How terrible, huh? How utterly terrible. That's the Roman sense of kindness, I guess. But break your bones and you die quicker. But then what does, what does the text do? Again, it points to quotes, of, uh, another quote about the Passover. 36, for these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not a bone of him shall be broken. Now that's not about... I mean, that's Exodus 12. It's about don't break the bones of the animal when you eat the Passover victim. Okay? And again, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. That's from Zechariah chapter 12. Next year, we're going to read Zechariah 12. And it's really a puzzle. It's a really difficult, so-called second Zechariah. It's really difficult. Except that there are a handful of verses that our ancestors saw as really clearly talking about Jesus. And this is one of them. They shall look on him whom they have pierced. Then Joseph of Arimathea comes to Pilate and asks to take the body. Verse 39, Nicodemus pops up his third time. And he brings a lot, a very expensive of perfumes to bury Jesus. Now you could see this as Nicodemus is moving to the light here, huh? Though you could also argue that he doesn't really understand Jesus yet because he's worried about Jesus' body. And Jesus is, you know, you don't need to worry about Jesus' body. I mean, you can take it either way. It's, it's, the jury is out. But, but, but I tend to see Nicodemus as a growing character through the, the gospel. And then they bind him and they bury him. Chapter 20. Um... The resurrection appearances in John's Gospel, unlike Mark and Matthew, but like Luke, all take place in Jerusalem. There are, all told among the Gospels, uh, there are six different accounts. And I think I've shared this with you before, that they are different, which causes some people distress, causes me no distress. Because if you know, again, what does a lawyer think, or what does a judge or jury think, when all the people who, are, <laughs> who get called up to give testimony give the exact same testimony? Well, then they say, well, who, who coached you? Huh? So the, the variations here are, are not anything that, to, to, to my mind, is anything but what should be expected. But with the, with the resurrection appearances, there are four of them. There are two at the tomb, and then there are two inside a room, okay? And the two at the tomb come first. Chapter 20. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene come to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the tomb had been taken away, the stone had been taken away, and she runs off immediately. She does not encounter Jesus at this point, but she goes to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said... They have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they have laid him. So Simon and the disciple make their way to the tomb. Evidently, the disciple is younger, or he's a better athlete. He gets there first, okay? But he does not go in. He waits for Simon. Um, verse 5. Stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. That's the love disciple. Then Simon comes and went in. He saw the linen cloth lying and the napkin, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen cloths, 
but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and then says, he saw and believed. Now, notice, it doesn't say that about Simon Peter. So, at the face value of the testimony of the gospel, which of them understands better? The beloved disciple. This is the typical pattern. The beloved disciple is always one notch above Simon Peter, which kind of clashes with Simon Peter in the synoptic gospels, particularly Matthew and Luke, okay? where he is kind of the future leader of the church. This napkin, let me say something dismissive, because maybe you read, don't believe everything you see online, huh? Someone will say that ancient Romans, when, when, they, when they ate at meal, and, and they had napkins, and if they rolled the napkin up, that was a sign to the waiting staff that they were finished eating. So by finding the napkin rolled up, it's Jesus winking and saying, the work is done. Now that's a nice homiletic point, but it's got no truth in Roman meal customs. There are no Roman meal customs like that. They didn't even use napkins, okay, in the sense that we do. So, I mean, again, if you hear somebody preach it, don't shout them down. But it's just, it's a thing that it, it expresses what the text is trying to say, but it doesn't have any root in reality. And if you hang your faith on that, when you meet somebody who is an expert in Roman dinner culture, they're going to say, well, I'm sorry to tell you, that's a fraud. Huh? So, just saying, don't over interpret, don't overplay the hand. Preachers, we tend to do that. Now and again. I think the gospel is big enough just the way it is. What it does say is what? What is, what is the, the, in Matthew's gospel, which we haven't read yet, um, but what, what do the authorities say? It explains why Jesus' body is in the tomb. His disciples stole the body. Okay, that's where it comes in. Nobody is going to steal a body, undresses it first, and leaves the clothes behind. Peter. Plus, Magdala seems to be a little hung up on the stealing thing, too. On the, or, on the stealing of the body in the beginning, according to Brown. Yes, well, again, because that's, that's because, because people, that's what the, that's what the non-believers said. I mean, what's the easiest explanation? This guy rose from the dead? Oh, come on. You just took his body. I mean, it's the most natural comeback, you know? It's a, for, for someone who's not a believer, it's like the most, it's the simplest explanation. You know, his friend stole the body. So it, it comes up here as well. So, but the, the, the care with which the garments have been dealt with are a, uh, apologetic in response to that argument, saying that's not the case. So, then they leave, okay? Then Mary Magdalene comes back, and she encounters the two characters, or is this one, it's one character, I think, huh? One angel, two angels, two angels, two angels, as they appeared in Matthew's gospel, who explain in Matthean words, he's not here, he's been raised, okay, no, um, actually, no, he just asks, woman, woman, why are you weeping? And, and she says, because they've taken him. And then she turns around, and Jesus is there, and he asks, whom are you looking for? Now, that's the exact same question, remember, back in chapter 1, when, when the two disciples of the Baptist followed Jesus, that was his question to them, who are you looking for? All right? So I, I, it's, it's, a, it's a nice kind of echo. And, and Mary just plunges right on to say, Assuming he's the gardener, sir, if you've taken his body, tell me where, and I will take him away. And then she says, Mary. And then she turned again, evidently, and says, in Hebrew, Rabboni, my, my teacher. It means my, my great one. Literally, it's my great one. And rabbi was a title for a teacher, my great teacher. Notice, Mary does not recognize Jesus until he calls her name. This is a motif you'll see in all the Easter appearances. And when again, why is that important? Because again, an accusation that modern um, dismissers of the resurrection would say is, well, 
The disciples just hallucinated, you know. They were missing Jesus, and they imagined him. It's like somebody had been married you know, for a long time, and, and their spouse dies, and they see their spouse in clouds and in a milkshake. And, I mean, you know, they, they're so looking, for, they're so missing. So, well, again, the, the, the evangelists, not just John, but the others, are already aware of that kind of, of like, accusation. And show, go back and look at the other gospel stories, they never recognize Jesus. That's why we're going to hear Luke's version this weekend, after the, after the Emmaus story. And that's, they didn't recognize him there, did they? Huh? But there, it, Jesus comes into the room, and they're still overwhelmed, and he shows them his hands. He says, here, look at my hands, look at my feet. It can't be anybody but me. Okay? So in all the Gospels, the apostles do not recognize Jesus. Which is, again, a part of this explanation that it wasn't the hallucination, it was the Christ. Okay? Now, verse 17. Go to my brothers. This is unique. Jesus has never called his disciples his brothers before. So this, the death and, and rising thing has altered. Go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father... And this is new too. And your father. In John's gospel, Jesus never calls, never tells the disciples to address God as their father. That's, that's, in, that's in the synoptics. Our father are in heaven. Not in John. Until this scene. All right? So that's, those are the fir that's the first two appearances of Easter morning. And then Easter night and a week later. That's verses 19 to the end. You know this story. I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to just point out some things. Jesus' first words are, you know, why did you guys leave me alone? No, it's <laughs> peace be with you. Shalom. And he repeats himself because um, the disciples are amazed. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Jesus never appears without giving an assignment. And then he breathes on them. You know this better than most churchgoers, that the word breath, like the word spirit, like the word wind, is the same words. In Greek, pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A. In Hebrew, ruach, R-U-A hard H, ruach. So when Jesus, now again, in American mind, we think, oh, my breath, look at my breath. And so we go, oh, that's gross. But that's not what John is doing. When Jesus breathed on his disciples, what is he doing? He's giving them his own life. And he's God who invented life. Okay? It's, it's the power and grace and life of God that he gives them. The Holy Spirit. And with that comes, if you forgive sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain them, they're retained. And then it goes on to say, Thomas was not there. Again, I don't know how your pastors preached about Thomas last week. Um, poor guy. He doesn't deserve the crap he gets. Because think again about the titles. What, what did Thomas ask for that the others didn't ask for? They, Jesus showed them his hands and his side. Here, put your, So Thomas is just asking for the same thing. I won't believe it until I see it. He's asking for the same thing. So Jesus appears a week later. Jesus gives Thomas exactly what he wants. You may think he's scolding Thomas. I don't. He just says, you wanted to see? Here, put your fingers in my hands. Put your hand in my side. Do not be faithless, but believe. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Okay, biblical experts. Who in any of the Gospels has ever called Jesus Lord and God before? but human beings? The answer is nobody. This is not, this is the strongest statement about Jesus that any character makes in any of the Gospels. So it's not that Thomas is a dork. He is the, he is the most articulate, expressive member of the crowd to say who Jesus is. Lord and God. If the, again, if the gospel was a movie, this would be the big finish. 
And the, and the orchestra would come to the bottom, whoops, clash. It's the big ending. It's the big ending. And it was the original ending. Look at verses 30. Oh, no, sorry, verse 29. Jesus said, have you believed because you have seen me? So think of it, think of it like a play, okay? The characters are talking to each other. Jesus is talking to Thomas and the others. And then it's like Jesus turned to the camera. He turned to the audience at home and says, you, uh, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Jesus is speaking to us. Now comes the conclusion. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's the original conclusion of the gospel. It's a nice, beautiful ending. It explains what Jesus' purpose was. Huh? That, I'm sorry, what John's purpose was, that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing we may have life in his name. So, again, many times we want to think of the Gospels as chronicles, as modern 21st century histories. They're not. They're not trying just to give us the, the facts, the details. They're, they're proclaiming Jesus' divinity. That's the gospel's purpose. That's why I don't get disturbed when Matthew, Mark, and Luke says the Last Supper was a Passover meal and John says it wasn't. I don't get disturbed when Simon the Sermon doesn't appear in John's gospel. I don't get disturbed because John is telling us what his purpose is. That is to know Christ as Son of God. Big conclusion. Time for a break.